Hey Brick Maniacs, welcome back to another Designer Studio episode. I got Dan joining me because we are taking a look at the D3A1, or the VAL as the Allies would call it, but it's a Japanese dive bomber. Love this model, love the cross element printing. Like you were saying before, bigger than you would expect, but Absolutely. still at the same time, very, very swooshable. Absolutely, yeah, it's, this, is a, this is a nice big model. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a Navy, uh, a Navy dive bomber, so mm -hmm. it, it's big and beefy, and it was never really meant to get to the target very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, it had a certain requirement it had to, had to fly at. And at the time, it was like 200 miles an hour. It's, it's, not, sure. it's not exactly slow. Um, but it, it was like a bomb truck, basically. It had, <laughs> it, had to, it had to carry bombs over long distances, mm -hmm. deposit them, and then make it back to the carrier. And that's how the, the, the you know, carrier warfare was. Mm -hmm. um, so fuel, fuel is, 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 is very important, and bomb load is secondary. And then, of course, you, you, know, you got to get it on target. So. Yep, got to gotta hit your mark. So it's a, it's a large plane. It's it's comparable in size to like the the, the, the famous JU uh, JU eighty seven, mm -hmm. the Stuka, um, you know, and it's much bigger than the Dauntless, so sure. the American counterpart. So it's 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 a it's a big beast. Two two uh, crew of two. Mm -hmm. um, you'll have the pilot. And you'll have the observer. And it's some interesting history. I mean, this this yeah. plane itself, this 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 actual plane, this tail number, and this color is the um, representative of the squadron leader. Uh, it's uh, what is his name? It's Kukachi Takahashi. Okay. He was the guy who led the dive bomber attack squadron on Pearl Harbor. This plane, first to go down, dropped the first bomb, first Japanese wow. bomb of the war against the United States on Ford Island. So this is, this is the plane. This is the color. These are the markings. It's from the carrier Shukaku. Okay. Um, they, they had all their VAL dive bombers um, attacked. The, put, the, uh, uh, put the pilot in the front so when it comes around. Right, he's again. got a nice mustache. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so as as all pilots do. Interesting thing about uh, the Japanese Navy, um, when they're planes, especially the dive bombers, th there's always a plane commander. There's always a, a, a you know a, a ranking member. He mm -hmm. doesn't have to be the pilot. So in the American system or British or German, mm -hmm. it's always the you know whoever the pilot is the highest ranking person. Um, it doesn't have to be this way. They have they call it the observer spot. Interesting. So he was actually a pilot, but there are other other there's, there's other aircraft um, piloted by you know the Japanese Navy mm -hmm. um, that the, the the observer the tail gunner would be the actual the ranking, higher ranking yeah. guy. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So it, it's it's yeah it, it's it's a different system. They were a very professional you know fighting force. Mm -hmm. These guys you know they'd all trained. They got these these planes uh, long before their you know, the the attack on Pearl Harbor. They were they were using them in China. Mm -hmm. Um, against the you know the the nationalist Chinese forces, and then um, when the war started, of course they were they were on the carriers. Um, this particular plane survived Pearl Harbor, went on to the Battle of Coral Sea. This, the pilot actually died in the Battle of Coral Sea. So oh, interesting. Well, and considering some of the uh, the the challenges that the that the that Japan faced moving into the war, it was kind of a necessity that this plane stuck around because they just didn't have time to develop further. Right, and it, it was it was it was a big you know it doesn't have retractable ending gear, which is mm -hmm. kind of a Everybody, well, how could, you know, in World War II, right. every plane had retractable ending gear, but it did its job. And they, they actually calculated that if they, all the money, or not the money, the, the economy of weight saving by not putting those folding mechanisms mm -hmm. actually allowed this plane to fly further and faster than if they would have put the, the folding retractable ending Even gear. with the drag caused by those, yeah. big, interesting, okay. So, the, you know, and it's a dive bomber, so there is actually like a calculus, a specific, that it, when you're in the dive, mm -hmm. you have to dive at a certain speed, at a certain angle, so that the automated systems on the plane do their thing. You know, okay. it releases the bomb, you, you're able to pull up in time. Mm -hmm. um, so there is, you know, those, those, the drag caused by those landing gear actually is part of the calculus on how big the air brakes are, how okay. big, you know, so this plane does have air brakes and I'm just gonna pick it up real quick. Yeah, absolutely. So you've shown off these features a couple of times, right. but, but this, is the, this is the official rundown. You, and I love that bomb trapeze, it's right. so Right, all the cool. bomb trapeze, yep. And so the idea of the bomb trapeze is that when you're diving, and you release your bomb, which of course is gonna go at a certain momentum, you pull out, you don't want your bomb to go right through your propeller. <laughs> right, yeah. So the trapeze serves to swing it down low, it, it stops at a certain point and the bomb releases, mm -hmm. uh, missing your propeller. So, uh, yeah, fun little, fun fact. Yeah, it's a cool on, function to have. On that initial bombing, uh, bombing raid against Fort Island in, in mm -hmm. Pearl Harbor, it did not have these outrigger bombs on it. The little, right. They they had to use um, they they basically had to exchange those bombs for more fuel in the, mm -hmm. in the fuel tanks. Did you decide to include those just because that would have been this is a more typical armament, whereas that one was specific that's well, it's to complete. Pearl Harbor. This this is complete. This is, so if you're to build this, this could be for anything. Mm -hmm. If you just don't, if you're trying to recreate the Pearl Harbor attack, just take that off. Got it. Um, this does include the tail gun. So. Um, 
The and I love the opening canopy too. Right, right. So the, the canopy and the real thing kind of like, it, it's like a bubble shell. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a bird cage. It's got all this metal framing, but it actually opens up. So you, if you're the tail gunner or the observer, you'd push it over your head. It would just kind of retract mm -hmm. into, the, okay. into the ceiling. And then the gun, you'd basically put the gun on its, in its pedestal. So right now we have it, they're, they're both shown, but <laughs> you'd pull that piece off and yeah, right, right, display right. it without with the... Nice to show all the parts that you do get encompassed in it, though, depending on what you want to be able to do with it. So. Right, and, and that is a, we, we do have a Lewis gun in there, but it looks exactly the yep. way that the, the, the appropriate Japanese gun would be, so. Um, as you mentioned, there are lots of cross-printing pieces. Yeah, the cross-element printing um, is rampant on this model. Right, all of these, the, the Rising Sun, the Japanese insignia, mm -hmm. on the top, and I should say the bottom of the wing, is all printed. Um, these, on the, on the side skirts of the wheels, mm -hmm. I think the, 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 the stripe on those, that, that sort of teardrop shape, that's printed, except the front piece is actually a Lego element. So you have a combination of Lego element and and printing there. Gotta love that color match. <laughs> there are some stickers on here. These, um, the roundels on the on the sides, those mm -hmm. are stickers. We just couldn't print them, and the, we figured we couldn't get them in decent enough quality. And then the, the uh, tail code. Yep. Um, those are all stickers. Uh, everything else you see is printed, though. Uh, I like the the pr printing on the propeller tips is, is my favorite. Yeah, super clean looking and adds a nice level of detail. It's kind of nice to have the red to work with in contrast to this much gray, <laughs> right? Right, right, and and. Uh, there's a misconception out there that the Japanese planes that attacked Pearl Harbor were white. Mm -hmm. They actually were not. They were painted really light gray. Sure. And this particular plane had a white stripe, and that means it's from the Shikaku, the, the, the carrier. So oh. all the different tail, you'll see red, you'll see blue. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes there'll be multiple stripes. Those are actually different uh, to, to distinguish the different carriers. Um, during the Battle of Coral Sea, this same plane was actually painted bright orange. So... <laughs> Okay. Well, I'm the leader. Follow me. Yep, no kidding. You're not <laughs> so, going to lose me. Blaine's origin. The sky. Right, right. So, it, it, there, there were. If you look up some of these, some of these planes had the most fantastic paint jobs. It was. This was cool. painted bright orange. It looked like hot lava. It was really cool. <laughs> okay, that sounds um, awesome. So, if you get a chance to, to to look it up, I mean, it would be great to wrap one of these planes. Yeah, right. Um, but they had the the Japanese had some of the most beautiful aircraft during World War II. Um, right before Pearl Harbor. They went from they were they were they started out a different color. Mm -hmm. um, they went to this sort of gray, light gray navy paint scheme, and then towards the later end of the war, they started painting them with the, with the, that dull green on top, that mm -hmm. sort of camouflage, white bottom, green on top. But this is this is early war. Um, I just love the way it turned out. It's just, it's 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 so like 1930s, 1940s, almost Art Deco, mm -hmm. a very very uh, you know new, modern Japanese mm -hmm. uh, style. Well, and, uh, yeah, the landing gear. I mean, just the style of the plane itself looks awesome from from a build standpoint. You know, it, it's it's got a lot of really cool functions, like with those folding right. wing tips, and then we talked about. And then I love as we get around to the camera here, the swoop of the wings. Yeah, that's what the shape. I mean, you just you see that and it instantly hits it like, oh man, that is well, exactly and it is. how that's the, supposed the, to The work. dihedral is that way on the wings. Mm -hmm. The the wing tips fold, and that is so it can fit on the elevators. Um, when the Japanese navy, navy, you know how they operate on the carriers, they actually arm these things below decks. So they send them up mm -hmm. uh, on the on the elevator, which is in the middle of the deck. So that's not like a modern plane where the planes or a modern carrier where the planes can hang over the, the mm -hmm. edge of the of the elevator. It has to fit on a certain size platform mm -hmm. to be raised up. So they would they'd raise these things up fully armed from down below deck, and you know they would basically fill everything up, get everything ready below deck, bring them up, and then launch. And it was very <laughs> very quick succession. So off they'd, they go. They'd get them up there. They'd have the, 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 the a lot of times the props would actually be running because mm -hmm. they're warming up the engines as they're doing this process. So. Then it's time to get up and go. Right. So the first batch, we only did 50 of these in the first batch. Right. Um, and I wasn't sure because it's, it's, it's very parts intensive. There's a lot of pieces to this plane. It, it's big. It's beefy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we only made 50 thinking, well, we'll see what the response is. And, of course, they sold out in you know, uh, less than an hour. You oh, think? super fast. Yep. Right. So we are going to have to make another batch of this. Mm -hmm. They will be forthcoming. So don't despair if you didn't you didn't get a copy the first time around. Mm -hmm. There's a couple, of course, going to each of our stores. They will be available first come first serve, yep, and then yep. we'll get another batch up as soon as we can find some time the the, the schedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think now though, especially you know, you, you, if you look at this as just the model alone, it's an awesome plane. But then being able to hear some of the history behind it, and then finding out the role it played, obviously in in, in America's involvement in World War II, um, that's what a, what an awesome well, awesome model. They were they were building these planes right up to the last days of the war. Mm -hmm. They made a they made some other later versions. They actually took a lot of the metal construction and recreated it out of wood. 
Oh, sure. So, I mean, it was industry, you know, Jap Japan was stretched that, that yep. hard for resources. They're like, what can we do with, with native products? And they, so they, they did a lot of uh, refining. So there's like later versions of this, that wooden fuselages, mm -hmm. uh, wooden wing assemblies. It's, it's pretty wild, so. Uh, but it's still, it, it soldiered on right through the end of the war. Um, I mean, there's, there's they, they found these, captured these things on the ground mm -hmm. when the, uh, after, the, uh, after the Japan surrendered. Very, very cool. Um, any other features for the model itself that you want to go over before we dive into this little two-man crew? No, I just, you know, I, I had such a fun time building it. There's, you know, fold, the folding wing tips, the, the working rudder, the, the bomb trapeze, the propeller, of course. Whoops. It's all oh, good. no. <laughs> Bye, pilot. <laughs> I didn't do that, did I? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, that's just all fun stuff, of course, the, the, the yeah. <laughs> I know it's, it's it's just it's packed with printing. It's packed with play features. There's literally nothing that you're that you're missing. It we just it need a big carrier to put right, it on. <laughs> right. But it's a, it's an awesome example of just a brick mania model. It's got everything that you want in it from the from the detail right down to the to the printing and play features. It had so. been a long time since I built a, ja a Japanese plane, let alone mm -hmm. a World War II aircraft. So I had a lot of fun doing this. This is like going back in, in time, and uh, I had a lot of fun. Sweet. Excited to see what the future holds. Now let's take a closer look at this two-man crew that's also included with the VAL. Uh, bring in Landon here and uh, hear a little bit more about these guys. All right, so two pilots included with this. Uh, tell me a little bit about these guys. Yeah, um, let's see. Where do I begin? I, that harness, let's start with that. That, that um, the Harnesses are so incredibly difficult to try yeah, to like, track where, where all the different um, belts are going. And then to like one, make it look like it was from a human, and two, transferred onto this weirdly proportioned minifigure. So uh, that was a challenge, but I think I, I'm, I'm happy with how this one turned out. Especially the, the coloration of it; it's a nice contrast to um, to their their kind of olive uniform. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of that olive uniform, there is some color shifting going on on there. We start out with a dark tan base, a little bit of uh, switching up the color uh, to, to get, get that olive. Yeah, yeah to get the olive. Um, wearing boot these high boots, and then. Um, some insignia on the shoulder, and that's different between the pilot and co-pilot. Um, so they are technically different figures, right? Okay. Um, you have the, uh, the Japanese flag on the shoulder, and um, what else? Oh yeah, a brand new life vest that I included on this one. So I've, I've made some Japanese pilots in the past. Um, I didn't have the life vest on the previous ones. Now I have this included. Um, kind of as I'm going along designing these mini figures, it, it, it um, sometimes I'll, I'll go for, um, just sort of for the sake of time, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe I'm being lazy or something. I'll just opt for kind of more minimal configurations, and then as I revisit it, I'll keep adding Add to more. it. So, yeah, sure. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So th this, is, uh, this is the current version. I think that's a, a nice addition to that. Um, Japanese have these really weird life vests that, like, it's like they have to, like, tie it underneath their legs, and it's just, like, it just looks very un un yeah, uncomfortable sure. and... Um, I can't even, yeah, it's just, it does not look like they're entirely comfortable when they're flying these things, but <laughs> <laughs> I guess if it's keeping you alive, then, you know. yeah. Well, I love the colors for it. I like the contrast, like you said, with the, with the harnesses. Obviously, those Brick Warrior helmets looking real sharp. Mm -hmm. So there you have it. Both the pilots for the D3A1, the, the VAL. Uh, Landon, thanks for going through theirs, and uh, thanks for watching.